good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so in this part of today's event, we will touch a neuronal basis of emotions. And why do we have emotions? What are emotions telling to us? And how to best manage them? But before I start my talks, I usually like to do a little warm-up. I have two kinds of warm-up. Raise your hands if you attended my seminars in the past. Okay, so, so you know what to expect. So you can choose either physical warm-up or social warm-up. You can't skip it, so you have to choose either or. Raise your hands if you want a physical warm-up. Raise your hands if you want a social warm-up. Raise your hands if you object any warm-up whatsoever. Okay, well, we're going to do a physical one. I'll ask you all to stand up. And this is, by the way, doing... So the, the whole point, this, this warm-up is, warm is going to be really ridiculous. But the whole point we're doing it is to get more oxygen into your brain. Because you already attended quite a lot of hours of learning. So in order to learn anything new, you need to freshen up a little bit. Okay? So we'll do as they do in the, in the boy, boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, British Army training. You know where we're going, right? So I'm going to sing a line and do something. And you'll need to do exactly what I do. To, you know, do it as intensely as you like. Of course, you don't, you don't have to go crazy. Okay, so I created this song, which is never going to be popular, but, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's to do with the brain. Okay, we all came here to learn about brain. It's all right. It's okay. It's okay. We're walking, walking. Run a little bit. Run a little bit faster. Run even faster. Jump up high. Squat down low, jump on the right, jump on the left, shake your shoulders, shake your booty, handshake one neighbor, and give a, give a big, big hug to another neighbor. <laughs> and grab a seat. I could see that some, some people were like, this is going to be bad, but don't worry. It, it can only get better from this point. So in order to discuss emotional, neuronal basis of emotional intelligence, we'll start with actually understanding what is the point of emotions from the evolutionary point of view. What's the function of emotions at all? Then we'll cover different types of emotions and look one by one what e each of those emotions is telling us. We'll also look at what are the triggers, individual triggers for different emotions, what behavior that evokes in us, and whether that behavior is serving us or actually getting in the way. We quite like to label emotions, oh, these are bad emotions, these are good emotions. But in reality, every single emotion has a purpose. It's the behaviors we engage in that either serving us or stalling us. So that's what we label good or bad. Then uh, about, at about 4 o'clock, we'll take a 10-minute break. And in the second part, we'll look actually at exact brain centers and brain chemistry. We'll look at where actually in the brain the emotions are created and how very strong emotions can change the way we think. How can they actually impair our rational thinking? And we'll actually I'll share with you one practical tip, how to calm your brain down if you're overwhelmed with emotional states. Then we'll actually discuss another form of affect, which is moods. And we'll discuss what's the difference between emotions and moods, and how can we manage our, our moods. At the end, I'll spend about 20 minutes answering any questions you, 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 you want to ask. And if you, if you get any questions throughout the talk, feel free to, you know, it's best if you keep them to, to the question and answer session at the end. All right, so um, emotions is the topic which has been, you know, fa fascinating many scientists throughout history. And not surprisingly, uh, Darwin was always um, in huge favor in finding the similarities bet between different animal species and trying to understand how did we evolve the way we are. So he kept observing the, how we react when we are angry as humans and how do animals react 
when they are angry, for example, in this, in this specific instance. So here he drew a picture of his dog, if he kind of, you know, annoyed his dog too much. Also the swan, if he came too close to the babies of a swan, how the swan reacted. And on the other side, you can see his wife when he came back home late. <laughs> so you can see that from actually just outward comparison, we seem to express those kind of emotional faces, especially in the strong emotions such as anger, in quite a similar way. Now, of course, there is no way to tell whether we feel emotions in the same way. Uh, and, and the scientists seem to fall into two very, very distinct groups. So one group of scientists say, actually, you know, humans and animals feel ba basic uh, emotions in a very similar way. And the way I feel when I'm scared is very similar to how the dog or monkey or cat feels when they are scared. While other scientists say, actually, that's complete bullshit. In order to feel the emotions, we need consciousness and we need to understand I am currently feeling the emotion, thus I'm, I must be feeling scared and da 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 da. From a you know, huge pool of, of, of articles I read, I fall a little bit on the right. That actually, emotions at the very basic level, in, in, in my current understanding, they are very primitive. And we share very, very similar brain circuitries, very similar brain areas underlying emotions. In addition to those primitive brain areas, or so-called subcortical regions, which we will discuss to great extent in the second part of the talk, we have rational mind. We have this all, you know, beautiful or ugly for somebody, wrinkly part of the brain, which creates thinking as well. We, we can think about emotions in addition to feeling emotions, but they are kind of two distinct, distinct processes. Now, based on that, you know, the, the uh, evolutionary point of emotions, the reason we have emotions is that we can quickly react to the environment. And, and that applies both to humans and any other animals, especially within, within the mammal, mammal kingdom. Um, and in the, in the animals group, uh, emotions are there to, for subcortical or those really primitive brain centers to analyze environment and to produce really quick output so we actually react to things very quickly. We don't waste time thinking and rationalizing and contemplating. So emotion is just the result of your brain functioning, of analyzing quite a complex data of, of all the environmental triggers. And we want to, re, to be withdrawn and run away for, from things which can cause potential danger to us and have a seeking behaviors towards things which can cause us pleasure or be, uh, be in favor of, of survival of the individual or the species. So in other words, the kind of emotions is just like a kind of mechanism in your brain to push you towards certain things and pull you from other things. So we can actually act very, very quickly. So imagine I'm cycling uh, in London streets and if there is a cab suddenly pulls in front of me, emotion such as fear is there for me to quickly react and break in time before I even start to think, oh, if the cab is in front of me, if I hit it at the speed, I, it's going to hurt. No, emotion warns me much, much quicker because if I had to go through that in such a slow cognitive manner, I would have been injured by that time. So each emotion in that, in that perspective follows this um, sequence. There are certain triggers. It could be, for human beings, it could be external or internal triggers. Even our thoughts could be triggers of emotions. And then there is certain emotion. And that emotion triggers behaviors or reactions. Now, a lot of times, as humans, we, we, are, we don't necessarily react in the... In the, in the way which is the most uh, serving us. So sometimes these, these reactions can be stalling us. And we, we will look at some examples when we look at individual, individual emotions. So here, for example, we have a rainbow of eight, eight different groups of emotions. There is quite a few different ways to classify emotions. Uh, but this is, this is, this is just one, one of them, which, which seems to have more neuroscience points, similarity between them. So, in this uh, classification of the emotions, there is five emotions to protect us from danger. And they are sadness, shame, disgust, anger, and fear. Two emotions to pull us towards pre pre pleasure 
excitement or joy, love and trust. And one of them, startle or surprise, is kind of in the middle. Raise your hands if you like surprise, if you love surprises. Now, for the ones who raised their hands, imagine you came back home and somebody broke into your house <laughs> and have stolen all the valuables you have, right? You probably wouldn't be as pleased. Actually, for me, what happened a couple of years ago, I came back home and somebody actually has broken into my house and have stolen my racing bicycle, which I absolutely loved and spent all my savings on. So at that moment, I didn't like a surprise that much. In fact, a year and a half later, somebody found my bicycle in Spain and I got my bicycle back. I loved that surprise, didn't I? So surprise is somewhere, it pushes one way or another depending on what the, what the outcome is. And we will go now, you know, to those emotions one by one and discuss triggers, what physiological changes in the body these emotions uh, evoke, and what behaviors we, we can, we can um, exhibit, and whether these behaviors are getting in the way for our progress, or whether they are serving us. So sadness, the first emotion is, is sadness. Sadness is a passive emotion to something in the environment or in, turn, in, in, in your own thinking, what's not good for you. We react in sadness to the, when we feel powerless to change the environment, but that environment is not good. So it could be you know, real powerlessness or it could be perceived powerlessness. So in this example, we have, let's call this lady Lucy. It's Monday morning, Lucy's at work. What could the sadness be telling us? So let's look at the sequence. The trigger is probably her job. Emotion is sadness. So it could be telling that something in her job is not good for her. Maybe she works with people who are constantly criticizing her and not giving any kind word to her. Maybe she spends all the day sitting in front of a computer and what she loves more than anything is working with people. So could this emotion could be just telling that she needs more interaction with people. So something for her is not working in that. Now, what does, what does Lucy do when she feels sadness? What reactions could she have? Any ideas? Binge yeah. Raise your hands if when you feel sad you have chocolate, donut, croissant, <laughs> cinnamon roll. <laughs> you, can, you can say that I'm guilty of that. Yeah, so sugar is actually a very good way to escape the emotion we don't like because sugar is very, very, very powerful chemical. It changes brain chemistry very quickly. So suddenly, our neurotransmitter levels alter and we no longer feel at that kind of suppressed, sluggish state. Energy level changes as well. So imagine Lucy starts, whenever she felt, came to work, she felt sad and she would go downstairs, get coffee and, and maybe pan chocolat. Is that serving her or stalling her? Stalling. Actually, it depends. On the if she keeps on doing that for five years, you can see what outcome she would have. It probably would be stalling her. But if she's in a really bad state and she just needs to push through, she can't, she, she's not in the mindset to change anything, it could be helping her to push through because those escapisms, they help us psychologically to survive. But on long run, they're keeping us stuck. They're stalling our progress. So what behavior could she actually choose, choose uh, which would be serving her? Any ideas? Yeah? Exercise? Yeah, she could, she could exercise. But we need to look, actually, we need something. This emotion is telling her something what she's missing at work. So how could she change that situation? Yeah? Exactly. She could evaluate what she needs to change. What was the, at the back? There was... Yeah, she could communicate better. She could sit down with her manager. And when her manager asked, how are you doing, Lucy? Instead of, you know, this very common, I'm fine, I'm doing fine. She would say, actually, I'm not sure, but something is not working for me. Maybe I need more training. Maybe I could explore, you know, maybe, maybe um, managing a group of people. Maybe I need to go on the course and do something in addition to that. So she could really try to be proactive to figure out, because some, a lot of times we don't know what's not working. Because our rational thinking and the subconscious thinking, they work in parallel. 
we can't access the, the whole mechanism of, of um, which kind of created that emotion. We can only speculate. But she could really have a thing, and she could maybe read some books on career change. She could discuss with some people. She could see what things excite her. And she could try to figure out what specifically could she change. Now, in the meanwhile, in order to get more energy, she could exercise, which was advised quite correctly. So to, get, uh, to pump herself up, you know, to, to have a bit of energy, because when we feel sad and sluggish, we're not very likely to be proactive. Second emotion, shame. Shame is built in our brain, so we do the right thing in society. It's a social emotion. And we can feel shame about a uh, certain outcome we delivered. So for example, if, you want, if you're a perfectionist and want to do a really, really good job, but you haven't delivered to the level you're happy with, you might feel shame. We feel shame if we mistreated somebody, if we you know, blame somebody for the thing they haven't done, or twisted the tables and you know, kind of changed the, the dynamics of the relationship in that way. We feel shame if we um, uh, treated somebody unfairly. We feel shame if we, if we got paid more than we feel we deserve. So shame is that so actually we are in a good relationship with other people. And if we deviated from our actions, which could cause the relationship, we feel shame to bring us back into balance. With shame, the same thing follows. There are certain triggers that, that trigger shame. So imagine if today I delivered talk and it didn't go to plan, if I felt I haven't delivered in the same, in as good way as I would have liked to, and if I felt shame, what, could, what reaction could be helping me next time? Maybe to think, oh, maybe next time I need to prepare harder. Maybe I need to spend an extra two hours rehearsing. Maybe I need to <coughs> present you know, to my husband five times before I give the talk. So that could be serving me. What behavior could be stalling me? Any ideas? Yeah, meditation could help, Be depending on the reasons. If I didn't do a good talk because I was too stressed, meditation would definitely help. But if I didn't do a good talk because I haven't rehearsed enough, then I, I probably spending that time practicing could help. But what behavior could be like, imagine if you were in that situation, what could you do kind of which would get in the way for your progress, yeah? Yeah, so imagine you, you made conclusion, oh, I'm, I'm rubbish at giving presentations, I'll never do it again. It's called fixed mindset. So then actually, you would never get better, and it might get in the way for you to do things you really want to do. So in fact, really looking at it and asking, what about it is upsetting me, and what is it that I can do about it that would be serving me rather than stalling me? The third emotion, disgust. Disgust is built in our brain so we are safe physically. Uh, we get disgust triggered when we see rotten food, when we see people that are really like unhygienic, you know, that they have like some wounds that are rotting and so on. <laughs> However, because our rational brain is somewhat, you know, interacting with our um, emotional centers of the brain, disgust can be triggered when we feel unfairness, when we see huge level of unfairness. So for example, I get really physical, nauseated if I hear stories of kids being abused. Or some people, when I did uh, this workshop on, on the emotions, when Donald Trump was elected, they said they felt <laughs> disgust that he was elected, you know. So and we all have our sensitivities. By the way, with, with, all of the, with all of the emotions, triggers are individual. Every single person has individual belief system, individual value system. Thus, different things can trigger that. By the way, another actually very common trigger of disgust is being cheated on. If people in a relationship, especially long-term relationship, figure out that they've been cheated on, especially if they trusted and said, I trust my, my partner 100%, they feel physically, it's very common for people to vomit and feel f physically nauseated because what actually that emotion saying, I'm not safe anymore, my world is shattered. So disgust is a very, very strong way to show that although you physically might not be in danger, but psychologically you feel like I don't feel safe anymore. Uh, so again, with disgust as with any other emotions, there is always trigger and there is certain which trigger that. 
And when we feel disgusted by certain behavior, it's very important to, to look actually, do I want to spend time with that person again? How can I avoid those people in future? Uh, and how, how can I actually, you know, grow and change as a person not to attract that kind of behavior? Anger. Anger is another emotion to the environment which is not good for you. But that's an active emotion in, in contrast to sadness. is an active emotion which wants to change the environment. A sadness is like giving, giving in to it, saying, okay, it's not good, but I, I can't change it. Anger is like, it's not, it's not good, it's not fair, I'm going to change it. Uh, anger follows the same, the same chain. There is a certain trigger then it triggers anger, and what we do with it, either is serving or stalling us. Probably one of the worst things we can do with our anger is to shame ourselves for it and say, you shouldn't feel angry. There is nothing to feel angry about. It's called emotional invalidation. And when, if we do that often enough and for long enough, we often get in that depressed-like state when we feel numb. Because anger is a very important emotion, it's very active, very strong emotion, which kind of causes big, big change in physiology to, to, and suddenly like kind of deny it is, is, is causing quite, um, you know, a lack of verification of your own reality. So when you imagine you've been treated at work unfairly, you've done really good work, you present it to your boss, and suddenly he used all the data and presented it as his own. Raise your hands if you would feel angry if that happened. Yeah? Now, what reaction could we engage when we felt that? Any ideas? You could, you could go and punch your boss. That's one way. <laughs> would they be serving or stalling? Probably stalling, right? What else could we do? Sorry? We could break some things, but would they be changing anything? No, if you, could, if, if you realize, okay, I'm working for an organization where actually the boss, who is supposed to be exemplary worker, is showing that kind of behavior. So in fact, challenging it and saying, I've, I've seen your presentation and I'm really glad that you th thought that my work is very valuable, <laughs> but next time I would really appreciate if I was, got the credit for it, right? And that's so-called nonviolent communication. Actually on YouTube you can watch Nonviolent communication workshops by Marshall Rosenberg. They're really good. You can access an hour and a half and three hour workshops online, which talks how to identify what thing is triggering the emotion and how to communicate in the way that you achieve your need to be met, but without, you know, stalling yourself and getting punishment yourself. Because if we attack people, we quite often attract attack back. And we'll discuss that a little bit on the, when we talk about the brain centers. Uh, fear. Fear is emotion uh, which signals that there is large amount of unknown variables that we feel out of control. What are the things you guys feel fear for? What, what, what are the triggers for your fear? Any, if you can shout without even raising your hand. One but. The, Depression. Raise your hands if you fear getting depressed. I definitely fear that, yeah. Suicide. Yes, suicide. Of course, if you, uh, that, that's definitely common. What else? Failure. failure. Raise your hands if you fear the failure. Now look how vague is the term failure, <coughs> right? And, and fear always coexists with the kind of lots of unknown. Raise your hands if you fear to be in debt or to be broke or to be poor. Raise your hands if you fear being loved by the loved one or losing people you love, right? So fear often comes with the topics we can't 100% control. We can't control our mental health. We can't control our uh, loved ones. We can't control our finances 100%. So fear accompanies that. However, similar way, when we feel the fear, what we do with it either will help to reduce the fear in future or will keep us stuck. So imagine if I fear being broke and as a result, to distract myself, I go shopping. <laughs> In fact, I, I, I'm, um, I'm just finishing my maternity leave and it's very, very common for moms, new moms, to spend their time on Amazon ordering things. I stopped my Amazon time a couple of weeks ago. 
because it's very good distraction, right? Oh, I need another set of nappies. Or oh, what about this baby gadget? What about the, right? You can, we can spend like, there is loads of loads of loads of ways to spend money. And it gives short hit of dopamine. We'll talk about dopamine later. However, we're getting in a worse and worse situation if the finances, that's what triggers your, your, your uh, fear circuitry. The other way to reduce fear is to really get in charge of your finances and to really get very structured, analyze how much do I need to live on, what are the basic expenditure, how much am I earning, and how much per week I can allow your, uh, myself to spend on whatever I like. Right? And, and, and once we get organized with that, then we can predict. And it's very soothing for rational, especially for people who are really, really rational. That technique usually works really well. So really get actually really organized. If you kind of want to go a step further, getting automated savings accounts, so created like every, you can decide even like random amount, even if it's 10 pounds a month, but creating that automated, that it's always 10 pounds a month going into your saving account. And that adds even more safety because then your, your, your rational brain teaches your, so those emotional centers of the brain, you're gonna be fine, things are taken care of. As we spoke, another emotional startle or surprise is there to prepare our body physiologically for unpredictables. It prepares the body if it was a danger that it could run away. As I spoke, and actually I've forgotten to mention with emotions such as anger, the energy, the glucose and oxygen from your brain digestive system and immune system go into your arms and into your limbs. So you could run away or you could punch somebody if needed. Again, sometimes that, you know, that could be helpful response. But uh, so in start loss surprise, it prepares body for very similar. So if needed, you physica physically are prepared for it. And when we feel surprised, right, we, we get that physical uh, feeling in our body. But if that thing doesn't happen, there is a catharsis, which feels really, really nice in the body. That's why we enjoy surprise. Excitement or joy is the emotion which actually it's a um, so-called thriving emotion. All the other emotions before surprise, all the five emotions I men mentioned, they were survival emotions. And this is, this is luxury emotion, thriving emotion. We can only feel excitement or joy when we feel in good enough state, mentally and emotionally. If, we ex if we're utterly exhausted, if we're very, very stressed, we are not capable of excitement and joy. That's then we, our brain doesn't have a, a physical capacity for it. But if we're kind of in good enough state, and there is things in our environment which are good for us, such as spending time with loved ones, having delicious meal, uh, exercising in the fresh air, meditating, it feels nice and it's triggering that actually it's good for you. Excitement and joy is usually emotion um, to kind of look out for when you're choosing your career path or you're looking for some, some things to explore career-wise. Um, it's good emotion for if you kind of want to choose what, what hobbies to pursue, and also if, you're, if you want to choose whom to spend your time with, whether that's friends or, 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 or partner. Also, you know, in, in other people, you, you're like looking out what things make other people excited and, and happy. That's usually a good way for them to spend time. My, my daughter, now her biggest, hobby is climbing the stairs. She could spend an hour just climbing up the stairs and then, ah, 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 okay, coming down. And she could spend literally an hour just climbing up the stairs. It's the best thing ever. You can give her any toys you like. Wouldn't work. Chewing slipper and climbing the stairs. Best thing ever. And the last emotion, love or trust. I put them together because the brain chemistry is very, very similar. And I'll mention a bit, a bit in greater detail oxytocin at the end of the talk today, uh, which actually is involved in trusting and caring relationships. I don't talk here about you know, passion or, or lust. I talk about the deeper love and trust uh, feelings. And these feelings are produced by the brain only and only if there is enough predictability. So your primitive centers of the brain, which in fact are really ever so complex, constantly keeps track of other person's actions and other person's facial expressions and what that person has said. And if there is any mismatches, it cannot create trust. It's not possible. 
However, if things are being congruent and you can really understand the other person's point of view and why that person acts that way, love and trust follows. By the way, trust is probably the hardest emotion to recover if that's been broken. Because the mammal brain, once it has that emotion, um, once it loses that emotion, it really, that, that it keeps a very, very strong memory of that, of that event. Um, so all of these emotions, they're like a compass, which is guiding us. These things are bad for you, these things are good. However, tricky things sometimes happen when our own thoughts trigger those emotions. And we look in the second part, we're looking in greater detail about how rational centers of the brain can trigger emotions and how emotional centers can change the way, the way we think. So in order to really understand how these emotions come about, and why we, do we think the way we think when we're in a strongly emotional state? We really need to look about the brain, at the brain structure and what are the key areas involved in both us feeling that emotion and being able to soothe and calm our emotional state. So brain, as you can see, is quite an ugly organ. And it consists of many, many different parts. And those parts are responsible for different functions. Emotions, interestingly, emotions are quite in quite a lot of different parts of the brain because there is so many complex um, processing to, 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 to regulate the emotions. Um, the very, very wrinkly bit on the outside of the brain is called the neocortex or cortex for short. And anything what's under that is often called subcortical structures. And this cortex is the, actually the newest addition to the brain. And humans have the most complex cortex in comparison to any other animals. And because the cortex of humans is so large, it actually had to be wrinkled up in order to fit in the skull. And of many other animals, monkeys actually including, they don't have uh, such a wrinkly structure of cortex. And especially in, in particular, if you looked in the brains of, of uh, rats and mice and, and, and dogs and cats, it's quite smooth actually because they don't have such a complex neocortex. And the most complex part of neocortex, the newest part and the most rational, the most uh, complicated is so-called prefrontal cortex. It's at the very, very front of your brain where the forehead is. And we know quite a lot about the function of prefrontal cortex initially from the people who actually have damaged prefrontal cortex. And there is, there is many ways, unfortunately, people can damage that. I wouldn't recommend, to be honest. But if you cycle without a helmet, you have high chance of doing that. If you fall head first, boom, done. Uh, if you don't use the seat belt while you're driving or when you're being a passenger, you're likely to damage your, your prefrontal cortex. Uh, if you fall down the stairs, Unfortunately, unfortunately, one of my friends, her mom fell down the stairs head first and has damaged prefrontal cortex. Stroke patients often have damage, and, and my dad unfortunately had three strokes all into the very front part of his brain, and prefrontal cortex was one of the centers to be damaged. However, one of the most famous cases of prefrontal cortex uh, damage was Phineas Gage, and probably many of you have heard of this case, but just so let me just tell very, very briefly without going into greater detail about it. So Phineas Gage lived quite a long time ago, and he was a manager at the railway company. He managed a small group of people. He was a father and a loving and caring husband. He was really one of those annoying people everybody likes, you know, like he was really funny and caring and nice and very structured and really, really good worker. And suddenly, uh, back then when they were exploding the rocks to extend the railway, they were using just the metal rod to make a hole. They would put explosives and, and use the same metal rod to stuff the explosives in. And while he was doing that, explosion happened because the heat was produced by the, when he was hitting that with the metal rod against the rock. And when explosion happened, the metal rod shot up in the air, crossed his jaw, crossed his eye, and got back at the top of his head. So it must have looked hideous, but that didn't stop Phineas. He, you know, he was on his own, so nobody could, could take care of him. So he stood up and he walked himself to the hospital, five miles 
He administered to him, himself at the hospital and started shouting at the doctors. And at that time, doctors thought, wow, that's a miracle of God. He's alive, nothing has happened. But after examining him further, they realized something has happened. And in the newspapers at that time, they written, Phineas was no longer Phineas anymore. His personality has changed. His animalistic nature has been unleashed. And that's to do with the damage to his prefrontal cortex. He became really impulsive, very quick to anger, very quick to frustration. He became quite animalistic if he wanted to, to, to have sexual intercourse with somebody who just approached the person and, and, and tried to rape them. And so he became a complete nuisance. And, and unfortunately, he was, he was quite frequently, you know, um, got, got beaten by other men of the village who wanted, and eventually he, was, he could no longer stay there. He lost his family, he lost his job, because he couldn't inhibit himself. He couldn't stop his urges. And he became quite an angry and he couldn't keep the job. And unfortunately, that happens to many people who experience prefrontal cortex damage. They can no longer suppress themselves. And that's to do because pre with prefrontal cortex having really, really crucial function in regulating our emotions. So initially, you know, we, we, we always thought that prefrontal cortex was the most rational part, which just was responsible for so-called executive function. So getting things done, basically, reasoning, decision-making, critical thinking, problem solving. But in addition to that, that very bottom part of it, called ventromedial prefrontal cortex, is a crucial center of our personality. And a very big part of who we are is our sense of self, our very individual values, and us being able to control us, ourselves, us being able to, you know, to stop and ask, is that appropriate thing to say? Can I do this now or not? What would the other person need from me now? So really to consider other people's needs and other people's points of view at a given time. Without the proper functioning of, uh, of ventromedial prefrontal cortex, we unfortunately cannot do that. Physically, we cannot do that. And also, prefrontal cortex is a crucial area for us feeling motivated and wanting to do things and getting pleasure in, in, in getting things done. And whenever we have that damaged, or if we have that suppressed, we can no longer do that. Uh, Underneath that complex, wrinkly cortex, there is so subcortical structures, uh, and, and some of them are grouped in so-called limbic system. Limbic system is just a kind of a conventional term of all the areas which are involved in emotional processing. And um, just to name a few, a tiny green area there called amygdala is one of the most important emotions, uh, one, uh, one of the most important areas to create emotions which prevent us from danger, fear, anger, anxiety, sadness, amygdala is, is to blame for that. Hippocampus is the, is the area I investigated to great detail during my PhD, and that's the area responsible for memory. But also it's responsible for remembering all the times when you've been worried in the past. So hippocampus is important for, for anxiety. And there are some other areas responsible, for example, um, hypothalamus, the, the other area just there in that corner, is responsible for changing your body to match the emotions you're feeling. So when you feel angry, you suddenly feel like completely different response in your body as opposed to when you feel happy or excited. So let's look at the amygdala to the great extent. So first of all, amygdala, this tiny, tiny uh, area of your brain, really ancient area, and animals have very similar amygdala to what we do, uh, it's a shape of almond, that's why it's called amygdala. It constantly screens the environment for any danger out there. If it, and if it does detect any danger, it, it warns us about it by creating anxiety, fear, or anger. Also, amygdala is responsible for so-called emotional memory. So it keeps track of all the things where you've been hurt in the past. So all the painful relationship events are recorded by amygdala. All the phobias are recorded by amygdala. So amygdala is never ever, you know, wants to forget anything what causes you damage in the past. And unfortunately, that's the hardest type of memory to change. When we feel very, very strong emotional response, amygdala can actually block our rational thinking. 
If you try to remember now the time when you've been really, really angry, you've been furious at somebody, or if you've been really jealous, or if you've been scared, like really, really scared of something, raise your hands if you've done something or said something that you regretted afterwards. In that state, if you've acted really, come on guys, be honest. <laughs> Yes, and actually probably every single person can relate to that if they have healthy connection between amygdala and prefrontal cortex. And unfortunately, there is a lot more fibers going from amygdala to prefrontal cortex than the other way around. So our, um, uh, it's about 10 times difference. So in fact, our amygdala can suppress our prefrontal cortex much stronger than our prefrontal cortex can suppress our amygdala. In other words, Rationally, we can't talk ourselves out of emotions. If you feel scared, or if you feel anxious or depressed, you can't just say, oh, don't feel depressed, there's nothing to feel depressed about, and you suddenly feel better. It doesn't work that way. However, if you feel emotion, suddenly thinking changes in the split of the second. It happens really, really quick, and that connection is very, very strong. And from an evolutionary point of view, it kind of makes sense, because imagine you're walking in the jungle, and you see the bush moving. And if you think, oh, it can be danger, I need to run away. But if you just kind of stand there and, uh, you know, contemplate, oh, that's a rattling bush, I wonder what could there be, and start, you know, thinking in your mind all the possible scenarios. You might be eaten if there was a predator. So it has to be a really, really quick reaction. Uh, and also, their cognitive thinking, prefrontal cortex, is a really expensive brain area. It uses enormous amount of glucose and oxygen. So if we kind of, you know, use our, our uh, prefrontal cortex thinking, we would consume the, the, the glucose which is needed for us to run away, for our muscle work. So that's kind of counterproductive for physical escape of the situation. However, when we are in a situation when amygdala is raging, it's creating all that emotional response, it suppresses our prefrontal cortex, and it's not always to the, you know, all or none. It, it can be sometimes somewhere in between. Uh, the, way, the things that trigger amygdala could be, as I said, like things that trigger anger, fear, anxiety, stress. St stress is one of the things which actually can suppress prefrontal cortex and activate amygdala. And we, we, we function then in the so-called amygdala domin dominant thinking. Uh, being really hungry, if you physically lack the nutrients, your body goes in survival mode. Then your thinking becomes much more amygdala thinking rather than prefrontal cortex thinking. And in that state, if you think amygdala's job is to keep you safe, in that state, Every single one of us become safety freaks and control freaks and really quite limited thinkers. You know, we wouldn't admit to that state, of course. So every single one of us in the middle of dominant state becomes quite similar, to be honest. We all act like a scared children and sometimes, you know, quite defensive and big ego type of uh, scared children. We become narrow-minded. We can't process complex, complex situations because those prefrontal cortex is needed to understand really complex scenarios. We can't, there isn't enough resources and there isn't brain area. We need prefrontal cortex to understand other people and to care about other people. So when we are in a middle dominant state, we can only care about ourselves. Physically, there isn't enough, enough uh, resources for, for, for caring about others. We're usually quite fearful and we, 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 stuck in, we get stuck in, in, in our own world. And in order to feel safe, we often have that black or white thinking, very binary thinking, very childlike thinking, you know, well, oh, this is right, this is wrong. We become quite judgmental. And that happens to every single one of us. Uh, it's it's quite, a, quite a normal, normal functioning of the amygdala dominant thinking. In amygdala dominant state, our reality is completely distorted towards noticing negative things. Because the middle job is not to point out pleasures. In that state, you need to know all the pos possible dangers. So negativity is amplified tenfold. And uh, that's why a lot of times in that state, the world seems much, much darker place than it actually is. We can't see um, a reality in the objective manner. In that state, we're much more likely 
to end up in conflict with others because we can't really understand other people's point of view or we can't express ourselves so others really really take that on board either and the worst thing we have negative mind chatter we have the worst enemy in there constantly reminding what's wrong in opposite in prefrontal cortex dominant state the same person becomes like a completely different person in that state every single one of us are unique an individual. We, uh, we can see the world in a much more objective way. We, 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 we want to understand how things really are. We are not that bothered with defending ourselves. We are much more capable um, and we are open-minded and calm. In that state we care about others, we can empathize we, and we can get to the level of where the other person is and try to see the world from their point of view. Uh, that state is crucial to accept the differences bet between the people and only in that state we can learn. Now learning and the brain is a very interesting topic. Uh, our brains haven't been designed to learn. Learning is the quality which kept us safe in the past, in the ever-changing world. And only, only when we have enough resources we can learn because that's a luxury quality rather than necessity for the brain. So only when we have enough resources and our emotional state is calm enough, we, our brain has resources for, for um, eff efficient learning. In that state we are authentic, we have individualities, we have every single person is different in that state, uh, as opposed to amygdala you know, similarities of, between people. And we can understand other people, we can grow, we can change, we can develop. And when we come back to that emotional, you know, trigger emotion response, we can make the most constructive response only in that state. A lot of times in amygdala state, we, we want, because it's too painful to be in that state, we want to escape from it. So what we do, we, we have uh, escapisms, sugar, alcohol, um, gambling, um, Facebook, procrastination, you name it, arguing, relationship arguments sometimes. So those two states, they create different ways of thinking. And not only strong emotions can trigger that, but also when we, get, when we feel the emotions for long enough, and the, the depression is quite a complex topic, I wouldn't cover in a great detail here, um, but I have a, a separate workshop where I talk about all the mechanisms of it. Uh, and all the causes, but in amygdala, if you scan the brain of yourself when you're in depressed state and when you're in non-depressed state, the biggest difference we can see in amygdala and prefrontal cortex, those two centers. In non-depressed state, our prefrontal cortex is active and amygdala is calm, relatively calm. When we are depressed, our prefrontal cortex is suppressed. Here in blue, it's, it's, it's not working properly. And our amygdala is uh, way too active. And if, if, if you talk to people who are severely depressed, they often say, in addition to feeling quite numb emotionally, they can't think. They can't learn as quickly as they used to. They can't, um, they're not that sharp anymore. And perhaps, you know, any, any of us, we don't necessarily need to be in the uh, severely clinical depressed state. Any of us can get in depressed-like states, which, you know, temporarily we get in that, in that situation. And in that state, our brain doesn't function as, as well rationally. Now, in order to calm our amygdala, there is, there is multiple ways to calm our amygdala. Actually, I'm just thinking, would you like to do one breathing exercise? which would help to calm, which is just one of the examples how to calm amygdala. Raise your hands if you'd like to do that. Raise your hands if you would like me to just get on with the content instead. No? Okay, so I'll ask you all to just, so one of the best ways to calm, because imagine, think of amygdala as really very young, scared child. It's not very complex thinking, you can't just rationalize with it. Imagine, look, if I think about amygdala as my daughter, Amelia, I can talk to her for hours, she wouldn't understand, right? So we need to use really quite basic, basic methods with it. One of the best ways is changing breathing. Because when we're anxious or scared, our breathing becomes really shallow. We breathe much quicker. And we, we, we create the secondary amygdala triggering just because there is not enough oxygen. So what we need to do, we need to slow down our breathing. And we need to distract our thinking. So when we, when we count our breathing and focus on breathing, that naturally reduces the amygdala. 
because it both changes physiology and distracts us from thinking anxious thoughts. And if we add some sort of positive visualization that triggers a relaxation state in the brain, and the brain cannot be anxious and relaxed at the same time. So it's, it's either or, it's quite binary. Okay, so I'll ask you to sit straight up in your chairs, put all the pens down, and I'll sit, I'll sit up there actually. And I'll ask you to close your eyes and put your, put your hands on your lap and just relax for a little bit. And just follow my guidance. Now breathe in to the count of four and fill your belly. Try to breathe into your tum tummy. Hold it to the count of four and breathe out to the count of four. Once again, breathe in to the count of four. Hold to the count of four. And breathe out to the count of four. Now when we're doing it the third time, imagine it's sunny outside. And you're breathing in that sunshine. You feel your tummy. You feel your chest. You feel your back. Feel how your shoulders relax. And hold it. Hold it for a bit longer. And breathe out slowly and gently. Now imagine you're by the sea. You can hear the waves crashing onto the shore. You can hear the seagulls. And you breathe in that sunshine and freedom. You fill your tummy. You fill your chest. You fill your back. And hold it. Hold it for a little longer. Breathe out slowly and gently. Now imagine it's winter time and you're sitting by the fireplace. It's really cozy. You maybe have a blanket around you and a cup of tea. And you breathe in that warmth and coziness. You feel your tummy. You feel your chest. Your back. And hold it. Hold it for a bit longer. And breathe out slowly and gently. Now the last time, imagine there is a little candle on the table <coughs> and you're looking at the flame of that candle and you breathe in that peace and tranquility. You fill your tummy, you fill your chest and you fill your back. Just hold it. Hold it for a bit longer and breathe out slowly and gently. And when you're ready, open your eyes. <sighs> Raise your hands if you feel a bit more chilled. Right? So just changing breathing, actually that's very simple. You don't even need to close your eyes actually when you do the exercise. If you often get anxious, I have that 4-4-4 four, four, four formula, which means you do that four times, breathe in to the count of four, hold to the count of four, and breathe out to the count of four, and do that four times. Actually, I used to use that when I used to get a bit anxious about giving presentations. I used to do that right before the talk, and it kind of calmed calm the amygdala down. And it's quite nice to have something to focus on for a little bit when you, you know, if you're in an anxious situation. Yeah, definitely. And there is many more breathing exercises. So breathing exercises is probably one of the quickest way to calm amygdala. And again, when we talk about amygdala triggering, it's very important to really have a think. What things trigger my amygdala? When I work with coaching clients, we actually make a list what things trigger my amygdala and what things help me to be in the prefrontal cortex state. So you can write the list. So for me, for example, uh, I get amygdala triggering when my husband criticizes me. <laughs> I get amygdala triggering if I see that there is any kind of dangers around my daughter. Uh, what else the, the triggers my amygdala? I can't think anything at the spot. What things help me to be in prefrontal cortex state? When I'm outside in the fresh air, breathing exercise, spending time with people I, whose company I enjoy, cycling, climbing. So it's, it's, it's good to keep, keep a track of those things and, and kind of Avoid the things which trigger your amygdala or try to develop coping strategies which help you to be in more prefrontal cortex state. 
Um, now that connection between amygdala and prefrontal cortex, it's not only like, you know, one of the solutions you would say, Gabia, I hate my uh, amygdala triggering my, you know, changing my thinking and switching off my rational thinking. Can you cut those connections down, right? You would ask me that to do that for you. And I would say, actually, no, I wouldn't do that. And the reason is that that connection, as bad as sometimes can, as annoying as it sometimes can be, is crucial for us to make decisions. And if you want a good read about how, emo how important are emotions and decision making, you can read this book, Descartes' Error, by Antonio Damasio. He's a really wonderful neuroscientist. And he once had a patient come to him. He was a very successful lawyer, and he had a brain surgery. And by mistake, doctors cut off his connections between amygdala and prefrontal cortex. And the intelligence of that person hasn't changed. He could still do the, the, the tasks as he could before, but he was constantly stuck in indecision. He couldn't make any decision. So Antonio asked him, he tested him on all the cognitive tests. He scored really, really highly on them. And then he asked, okay, when, when shall I see you next time? And this man sat for hours, listing all the dates and times and pros and cons, but he couldn't make a decision. Have you heard, by the way, that metaphor about the donkey? Imagine there is a donkey and there is two piles of hay, the same distance, exactly the same distance from the donkey. And donkey standing there has only rational thinking. It's trying to decide which pile to eat from, the pile on the right or the pile on the left but exactly the same, exactly the same distance. Which pile shall he eat from? Anyone? Either, really, right? It doesn't matter. But the donkey cannot make decision and it starves to death. So in fact, his patient was exactly like that donkey. He was constantly stuck in indecision. And, and, and uh, this led Antonio investigating people who had ventral medial prefrontal cortex <coughs> damaged for one or another reason. And those people, and this is like if I open the brain, you can see ventral and medial prefrontal cortex where the color is there. So what happened to these people? He actually examined their behavior. They were very similar to Phineas Gage in some ways. They were stuck in quite a selfish way of living. They couldn't take other people into the decision making process. They were really impulsive um, and they were constantly stuck in indecision with very, very simple things. So for example, they would go to a um, supermarket to buy yogurt and there is 20 different kinds of yogurt and they would spend three hours and they would leave a supermarket crying without no yogurt. Right? So I know it's, it seems, it sounds quite um, crazy, but that's not a, not, that's not a straightforward thing to tackle. And when we actually, when we get in a quite depressed state, a very similar thing can occur. When, we, when our amygdala is overly active and prefrontal cortex is getting suppressed, we can get stuck in indecision, even with very, very trivial decision. And what, what can help to get out of that, not, with, not for people who already have a damage to those areas, but for people who are in that indecision because of so, somewhat depressed state, is practicing making insignificant decisions quickly. So imagine, make yourself, before going to supermarket, make yourself promise that you'll buy a third yogurt from the left, right? If you can't make decision, take the third yogurt from the left, buy and leave. Some yogurt is better than no yogurt. Would you agree? <laughs> right. Okay, now for the, for the last part of the talk, we'll discuss the difference between emotions and moods. So what I wanted to show in the, in the previous part, emotions are crucial in making sound decisions. Emotions are guiding you, what's good for you, and what things might be harmful for you. Now, and that's why emotions usually are very quick, and they're quite strong, and, 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 and they, they, they're rapid onset as a result of certain thought or certain trigger in the environment. They're caused by a specific event, and they, they kind of tell you about that specific event. So it's an information about situation and thus they are valuable for decision making. Now moods, so I can give you an example, emotion could be, imagine you feel fear uh, when you try to climb, 
fear of heights, right? Imagine you're doing rock climbing and you get really scared when you're at a certain height. So it's your brain's way telling, you know what, this can be dangerous, watch out. Now imagine you wake up in the morning and you feel scared. You don't understand why. That could be mood. Moods are much, much uh, weaker than emotions. They are much more long-term and the onset is not very clear. You can't just say, oh, I feel scared because of that. Uh, the, the, the cause, the cause it, it can be un, uh, very unclear and they are so-called unfocused, which means like we can't you know, understand the link between the events and the mood. So the moods, in fact, they are information about your current state of self, or in other words, current state of your brain chemistry. They tell you like your life, your lifestyle is producing this brain chemistry. And that's why I feel that way. So let me tell you, and, and if we think too much about it and take that into decision-making process, we can make quite big mistakes. Imagine if you, if, you, if you wake up and feel sad, but you think, oh, that sadness might be caused by my partner, and you go and break up with your partner. If that's mood, you made a bit of an error. <laughs> How can we address moods? In order to address moods, we need to understand a little bit brain chemistry. So I'll tell you about the four different brain chemicals. There is a, a way more, there are 64 of them actually at least. And, and they create different moods. And we can change the, those chemicals via altering our lifestyle. Serotonin is probably one of the best known neurotransmitters through the link with depression. Uh, serotonin has quite a few different functions. It controls our body temperature, it controls our sleep, our mood, and also it helps us to deal with pain. When we have good levels of serotonin, we're not that annoyed by, by painful things. Lack of serotonin can cause depression or depressed-like state. Uh, and, and what things can actually uh, trigger serotonin? Uh, very simple, spending time in the fresh air and in the sunshine, <coughs> summertime, we naturally have more serotonin. Also, usually we have more serotonin in the first part of the day, up until 3 o'clock. So kind of some of you already have low doses of serotonin. Uh, we need more sunshine. This, that's why we did exercise at the, at the beginning, by the way, to get more serotonin. Just kidding, actually, on that. So uh, um, aerobic <coughs> exercise, such, such as jogging, walking, uh, Nordic walking, cycling, help to, to trigger more serotonin in your brain. Now, certain mood therapy uh, things such as gratitude list, mindfulness, meditation can actually increase the levels of serotonin. Laughter and time with friends uh, can increase the serotonin as well. Physical contact such as massage and certain supplements you can buy actually from Holland and Barrett 5-HTP supplement which can increase serotonin levels slightly. Now, those, old, uh, those changes to lifestyle don't have an immediate effect. Very important to realize that actually it takes regularity to change the levels of serotonin and they, it's quite a slow process. So if you take 5-HTP supplement, it, you won't notice immediate effect. Uh, neither, with, by the way, antidepressants. Uh, they target serotonin circuitry and the, the most famous SSRIs, they kind of make the serotonin linger between the neurons for longer and that's not immediate either. So it's quite slow. So if you notice that, so that's why it's very important to, to actually do a bit of the inquiry. What is my physical activity? How much time do I spend with other people? Um, how much, how much, you know, uh, how grateful do I think for, for my life? What's my attitude? Because our thoughts change our brain chemistry. And if you think, if you have really, really active mind and constantly negative mind chatter, changing your focus and writing, uh, by the way, the gratitude list, we can change that what went well today list. Because for some people, gratitude is just too vague thing. But if you write, okay, what thing specifically went well today? Because then your brain would be focusing a little bit because your brain naturally is designed, especially subcortical regions are designed to notice what things didn't go well. But if you actively start asking, write five things, ten things that went not so bad today, that went quite well, then your brain start, suddenly would start producing small increase in serotonin to do with that, that change of thought. 
why do we like actually eating donuts and other things? Serotonin actually helps to trigger levels of serotonin. Another neurotransmitter is actually one of the most pleasant ones, is dopamine. Anything that you enjoy, anything that gives strong pleasure to you, you enjoy it because of dopamine. Because when we get depressed, the levels of serotonin are reduced and levels of dopamine are reduced. And even the most pleasant things in life no longer cause ple ple pleasure if there isn't enough dopamine in your brain. So it's very physical. And if, you, if I put the electrical wires to the dopamine centers of your brain and just you know, zip it a little bit, you'll feel pleasured out. You'll be like, oh, Gabby, that's amazing. Uh, and and actually, actually, there's quite a few experiments done with both rodents and humans with putting, putting uh, electrical wires into the pleasure centers. And both humans and rodents became completely addicted to that electricity zip. And humans actually were begging doctors to take away the remotes because they, they, all they did is just zipping themselves. And, and, uh, and rodents, actually, they would forget to drink, forget to eat, wouldn't want to, you know, to hang out with their mates, and they would die of starvation, just zipping themselves with electricity, uh, <laughs> causing pleasure. So it's quite a physical thing, you know, it's not, it's in the brain, very kind of those, those things as pleasure and emotions are caused by very, very specific chemical, uh, chemical changes in the brain. So dopamine is needed for us to feel motivated and to feel us, for us to feel excited to do something. We need dopamine for movement, and in Parkinson's disease, dopamine circuitries are affected. Um, we need dopamine to feel, to just enjoy things and, and, and have pleasure. However, anything that feels good has a potential to become addictive. And some things cause enorm much higher uh, doses of, of, of dopamine. I had, usually had a slide before with the, you know, what's, uh, how much dopamine different drugs of abuse cause, but I took it out because some people said that it kind of motivated them to, to try some drugs. <laughs> I said, you know what? So imagine if your normal state is 100 molecules of dopamine. This is really arbitrary. And imagine if you've eaten really, really delicious food, like a really nice piece of steak or like whatever you enjoy, right? It's, let's say it's 150. Now imagine you came back home and made love to your husband or wife or somebody you really like. It's 200 molecules, you know, double the dose. Imagine if you took meth. It's 1,000 and 100. It's 10 times more pleasant than your baseline. And it's how many? A, a, a lot more pleasant than anything else you can experience. So it's, it's quite crazy, isn't it? So that's why I don't put that slide. And that's, and that's why people get addicted to it. Now, the worst thing is with dopamine, very important to, to, to remember that we get desensitized to pleasure. So if you keep on doing something that causes you enormous amount of pleasure, two days after, you're much likely to feel flat or quite depressed because you used up the molecules of dopamine. And your brain needs some time to replenish. That's one reason. And second reason, if we have a lot of dopamine, we have less than we, uh, our kind of neurons internalize the receptors, which means that actually there isn't the sensitivity to that is reduced. And don't want to get into great detail, but people who are addicted to substances of abuse, for them, things don't cause any pleasure whatsoever for a while because they're desensitized to, 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 the, to, to pleasure. Now, there is constructive and destructive ways, of course, to cause dopamine hit. So recreational drugs, on that side, you know, some of them are not that bad, but but first one I definitely wouldn't recommend. Sugar causes good hit of dopamine, uh, coffee, uh, and certain distractions, procrastination. The reason why people ask, I hate procrastination. Why do I procrastinate? Well, because you get quite a lot of dopamine from it. Uh, like checking Facebook games, anything that kind of has unpredictability. So, for example, you, you, when you open Facebook, you don't know what's, what you're going to see there. When you play certain computer games, gambling has certain level of, of unpredictability. That causes dopamine hit. But there is actually some more constructive ways to get dopamine hit. So, for example, taking a task you need to do and breaking into small chunks and getting those things done. But for that, we need to be really, really specific. And we need to break the task in the, in the, in the steps which take about 10 minutes to complete, 
not longer, in really small chunks. And achievement, achieving causes dopamine, even if it's the task we don't like to do. Meditation increases level of dopamine. Uh, hobbies, like whatever things you like, you like because of dopamine. You wouldn't enjoy it otherwise. Being, being in the job you, you love and being with people you like. Probably I should have swapped that, those love and like around, shouldn't I? It says that I like my job. <laughs> Another neurotransmitter, GABA. Same with his wife. <laughs> Sorry? The same as his wife. Yes. Yes. Uh, GABA is a neurotransmitter which is so called inhibitory neurotransmitter. What that means is that in the brain, there is on and off buttons. All the other neurotransmitters were so called excitatory neurotransmitters. Now, GABA reduces amount of thought. Because imagine if you had 1,000 thoughts at the same time and you had no way to reduce those thoughts. You'd probably go crazy. Now, GABA is the way to reduce the thoughts. When we have good levels of GABA, instead of 1,000, we have 10 thoughts. And then we can focus on them, right? But when we naturally have less GABA in our brain for one or another reason, we have really scattered mind. We have a lot of mind chatter and we can't reduce it. Uh, also, GABA is crucial to, to kind of make things clearer, not only at the mental state, but also at the kind of really physical state. So, for example, GABA helps us to coordinate our movements. If we have a very small amount of GABA, if we have no GABA, we would have epileptic seizures because all the muscles would contract at the same time. Also, we would not be able to see things because GABA is involved in many, many different things and it helps us to kind of be in focus when I'm looking at something. It kind of, you know, blurs other things. So GABA is crucial to regulate many, many things. And lack of GABA causes anxiety as a mood. I, I can discuss a bit more about anxiety later, but anxiety can be both emotion or a mood. As emotion, it falls within the category of fear. There is some, some differences there. But as a mood, it just says that you have low levels of GABA and you need to do activities which help you to increase your levels of GABA. Now, why do we like drinking alcohol? Anybody? Yeah, and what does that do? It actually triggers GABA circuitries. Imagine you're stressed. What's, what is stress? is focusing on many, many things and being tired of this mental processing. And you want to switch those thoughts off. And you need GABA to do that. Now, GABA is quite a slow process to increase your GABA levels. But if you drink alcohol, alcohol in the brain pretends that it's GABA. It's a very similar structure. So it can join to GABA receptors. And it can switch off the thought process. The problem with that is that it does that unselectively. So sometimes, imagine if you have 100 thoughts, 50 of them are happy, 50 of them are unhappy. If it switches off, you know, if it leaves 10 thoughts which are unhappy, you'd be miserable after drinking. But if it leaves 10 thoughts which are happy, you'd be quite happy. So it kind of, it's hard to predict what effect it would cause. Also, it actually deactivates uh, the motor function and prefrontal cortex functioning. So in other words, when we drink alcohol, we become quite dumb. But we don't really know about that because our critical thinking is impaired. But it sometimes helps to reduce GABA. And for some people, actually, it's a nece necessary thing to switch off because overactive brain is much more damaging, actually, than you know, a drink of alcohol. Now, how could we increase GABA? There's quite a few different ways. Physical exercise in general is one of the most powerful ways to change your brain chemistry, such as walking, running, yoga, meditation, mindfulness, breathing exercise, doing you know, that amygdala soothing exercise could help to increase GABA a little bit. Certain foods, such as oats, bananas, nuts, you just don't, don't combine them all, you know. Oats, bananas, nuts you can combine, but don't add broccoli, spinach, and potatoes. <laughs> Although maybe that would make a good smoothie, actually. Maybe without potatoes, I would say. <laughs> and uh, avoiding excitatory foods. Um, I, I sometimes do seminars with this hypnotherapist, an NLP practitioner called Jimmy Petruzzi. And he often tells the example about this lady he, he was coaching. And she had enormous amount of anxiety. And she, she's seen many different practitioners. Nobody could help her. And she just, he just by kind of random asked, 
uh, what would you like to drink? She's like, oh, I would like some coffee, just black strong coffee. He's like, how many coffees do you drink a day? Oh, about 10, 12. <laughs> and then he was like, okay, well, maybe let's address that. And actually, for her, anxiety was purely physical from just drinking too much coffee. Uh, but uh, I don't say that for everybody that's the case, but it's actually trying to reduce, you know, things such as coffee intake, sugary drinks, sweeteners, and, and any fast foods as well. And as there is some sort of like herbal remedies which can help to manage mood as well. Um, one of the ones actually which, which I've tried uh, is passion flower. It's one of the best ways to, to, to deal with the PMS, if anybody has PMS. Highly recommend it. Uh, because it, what it does, it just like naturally increases level of GABA, so you have less, less anxiety. It doesn't make a big shift, it just kind of reduces your, your, your amygdala ever so slightly. And, and there's a couple, couple other things, such as taurine and magnesium supplements, but all of them, as I say, they're kind of slow, slow way to change it. Then last but not least, oxytocin, or love and trust, uh, an attachment hormone. It, it helps our brain to be in a replenishment state. If when you, you know, when we hug people, if you really enjoy cuddling, you enjoy cuddling because of oxytocin, that kind of nice relaxation, or when holding a tiny baby and feeling that, you know, overwhelming feeling of love and care, that's oxytocin. Or the same we have when we have a pet, or, you know, if we're spending time with people we really love, that's oxytocin. And we can increase our levels of oxytocin with physical contact, I wouldn't go into greater detail about it. There is many ways. <laughs> Loving and caring relationships, people, people with, being with people who bring the best in you, increases oxytocin. A responsive parenting, meaning you know, you kind of paying attention to your child, increases oxytocin both for parent and for child. Photos of babies and kittens also increases oxytocin. That's why we keep on browsing them. And now just, just let's, let's summarize and I'll be ready to take any questions you have. First of all, emotions are there for you to warn what things are harmful and what things are good for you. They're important for, for, for sound decision-making process, especially if individual and subjective happiness is the outcome we're looking out for. Uh, emotions are neither good nor bad. Each emotion ne is needed. However, the behaviors we choose when we feel those emotions either are serving us or are stalling us, and that's what we can label good or bad, right? Amygdala and prefrontal cortex create very, very different ways of thinking, <coughs> and connection of them is, 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 is important, although annoying sometimes. Amygdala can switch off our rational thinking, and we become in a very, very different state of mind. And very, very important is to realize what things we're capable of in that state, when either we get in amygdala dominant state or another person gets in the amygdala dominant state. It's not possible to make a really sound decision. It's best to kind of take a break, relax, do any amygdala soothing activities. Actually, me and my husband, if either of us get that state, we just say, amygdala timeout, amygdala timeout. <laughs> and we, we know that, okay, it's not the time to discuss anything. Uh, and um, last but not least, moods constantly tell us about what's your internal state of brain chemical. And, and brain chemistry is not immediate. It takes time to, for your brain to replenish and change the, 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 the chemistry. Uh, and, and altering your lifestyle can change to manage, manage your moods. Well, thank you for your attention. I'll be ready to, to, to take any questions. If you need to get in touch with me, that's my email address. Niall will send you the slides if he hasn't done yet. Uh, if he, as he mentioned, my website is there at the bottom, mybraindurongtheday.com. And if you want to get to know a little bit more about mental well-being, especially about conditions such as depression, anxiety, or OCD, or PTSD, uh, I'm running a four-hour workshop in London uh, in a month's time. So, so I'm ready to answer any questions you have now. Uh, there is Niall with a microphone, Niall number two with a microphone. Uh, and just, just raise your hands. There is a, there is a guy with a check green shirt at the back, which was first, I think. Hello, my name is Chris. Thank you very much Hi, for that Chris. presentation. Um, I have a question about memory. Yeah. So I think we all know we need to be in a certain state to memorize things easier. How does... Um, 
the way how I memorize things reflect on how I am. So for example, I'm really bad with memorizing names. Mm -hmm. So does that reflect somehow that I actually not interested in human connections or? Yes. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, actually, just quickly, I'll discuss about memory actually on the 28th of July. I'm giving another talk on neuroscience of productivity, again in the weekend university, but very briefly. We have different kinds of memory. What you're calling now is so-called semantic memory or memory for facts. There is other type of memory, episodic memory, memory for events. What happened, where did it happen, and when did it happen? Now, there is some other types, more implicit memory, such as procedural memory, or being able to remember skills, or being able to remember emotional reactions, or be, being able to remember some sort of automatic, automatic responses. So there's many, many different kinds of memory, and every single one of us has a very unique profile. If you rank yourself 1 to 10 in each of those kinds of memory, you would have your own memory profile. Some things you would be really good at, other things you'll be really rubbish at. So it's very important to realize what, what of those memories is your strength, because different brain areas are involved in different kinds of memory. For example, for episodic memory, area called hippocampus is crucial. And for, for uh, semantic memory, neocortex, kind of different areas, but prefrontal cortex and, and up there are really, really important. Some people actually have really, really bad facial memory. I have really bad facial memory. Uh, to a point that if, has anybody, does anybody like Adam Sandler movies? Yeah, like, let's be honest, we do like it, it's funny. But if Adam Sandler is, is, gets a different haircut, I don't recognize him. And I know it's ridiculous, and my husband is completely opposite for that. So I think we all, it doesn't re reflect to kind of, you know, your intelligence. It just tells, it's, it's just a sim symptom, basically, which brain areas are functioning to the high extent. Can we increase our certain kinds of memory? The answer is yes, definitely we can. Brain is plastic, and if we selectively keep practicing on those skills, we'll gradually get better at that. One way, if you want to remember facts better, uh, one way actually we can do that is associations. Because why associations? So imagine I have to remember, let's say, uh, oh, a car registration number, right? And if you, if you, for each letter, create a word and create how those words, um, for, for example, our cars, three last numbers, is Fox Dance Zumba, FDZ. <laughs> It's much easier to remember Fox Dance Zumba than FDZ, isn't it? So, so um, you can kind of create associations. And that, that in, in addition to neocortex, it involves hippocampus as well. So then the more brain areas we can activate, the better we remember. And second thing, if, if those associations trigger emotions, such as laughter, it, we are much more likely to remember. <coughs> because emotion, if we feel some sort of emotion, it already marks to the brain that that's important. If we feel nothing about it, we don't remember. And let's be honest, we remember the names of people whom we notice. If you saw somebody really super attractive today, you, I, I bet you would remember the name of that person. Okay, any other questions? Um, you mentioned that, um, and I have a question about memory too, just about anxious memories or traumatic memories, phob mm. phobic memories. Um, in your experience, you said they're difficult to work with, but I'm just curious. Very difficult. How, how, what are the you know, more modern approaches to working with those? Yeah. Um, so when we work with some sort of, let's say, the, it depends where, at what age trauma happens. If it happened at really, really early ages, uh, like uh, during childhood, we need to use quite um, basic um, techniques and um, as I mentioned this, this, this colleague of mine Jimmy Petrucci he uses hypnotherapy and NLP practices with that uh, to be honest I'm not trained in that so, so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, to kind of address that uh, there is other way is inner child healing which again is for amygdala soothing it's just another way to, like in, if, you, if you're familiar with transactional analysis it kind of splits if you like our personality into three states in a child, which is more amygdala dominant state, in an adult, which is more prefrontal cortex dominant state, and in a parent, which is kind of somewhere in between, but it has quite a lot of amygdala judgment. 
So in that technique, you kind of retrain your, you listen to what your inner parent is telling to your inner child and you, you retrain your inner dialogue because a lot of times we keep re-traumatizing ourselves with our negative mind chatter. So that's one way. And um, I'm sure uh, counselors and psychotherapists work on changing that dialogue as well. So that's, but um, if, if there is really some sort of deep, deep trauma at the physiological level, sometimes hypnotherapy can help to address that as well. But I, I'm sure so for some people actually just purely understanding what happens when and trying to avoid triggers and just talking about triggers and validating the emotional state can help to reduce the response actually. Because um, there is a quite a good book called Healing Connection about how we can heal the relationship traumas via constructive relationships. So imagine if you got really, really bad experience in your romantic relationship. You've been really hurt and maybe lied and cheated on. And if you're not in any relationship, there is no triggers. But if you get again in a the relationship, there's plenty of triggers. But if that relationship is caring and, and soothing and that you with that person can explicitly discuss that, it will be healing your, your trauma bit by bit. And actually, when we're in love, there is high levels of oxytocin. Oxytocin increases brain plasticity. So we can actually override those memories bit by bit. So I've heard this phrase some, somewhere that time doesn't heal, experience does. And from the brain perspective, it definitely helps. If you had uh, emotional trauma from, let's say, giving talks, and you, you kind of been, have, you know, like a real phobia of giving talks, the only way you can address that if give a, is give a talk in a really, really safe environment and grow from there. I had a phobia of swimming at some point because as a child I kind of you know, had near drowning experience. So what I did, I went on to the swimming course with an instructor who, who, who seemed to have an eye on me and he just kept you know, watching me all the time. I was like, this is brilliant. And bit, because I started to feel safe and bit by bit, I learned to trust that actually water is not there to kill me. And, and I overridden that, that, uh, that memory. Every now and then, we can fall back into those phobias. When we go through hard times, when we are stressed out, that can surface again in the same process, but it's much easier to get back to the safe place again. Hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, with the babies, very similar. It's, but because I think those centers in the babies, they are very much in amygdala reactive state. There was a question that's just there at the back as well, actually. What happens to, I guess, the brains of people, like children today are growing up with Facebook, so they're constantly getting those dopamine hits mm. or um, over excessive amount of information so you can't quiet your mind chatter, so your kind of GABA is off. What, what, ha what happens like when they grow up and well, when we grow up? Yeah. And um, are, are we just dependent on the supplements to... Yeah, I think one, actually if the brain starts developing from that environment is not as bad as it's much harder for us who grew up and I kind of, you know, I, I hope that you also grew up in a similar time because as children we had only one cartoon a day. We had to wait till specific time of the day and it was just 10 minutes and that was it. We couldn't watch endless amounts of cartoons. So we kind of grew up with very different digital environment. And now kids growing up with that, they learned actually to filter out the, the noise much, much more effectively. The brain, because it's bombarded with information all the time, it has to adapt to it. Otherwise it would become crazy. So it's usually the people who kind of grew up in different environment that struggled, struggled to, to, to deal with that. But nonetheless, having said that, still I would, I would suggest if, 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 you, if you are with, with young kids to still kind of train their uh, long-term thinking and willpower because those are the skills which, which I think we're lacking to great extent in the, in the younger generations nowadays. Yeah, I was just kind of curious, like if someone holds an opinion that's demonstratively false. Mm -hmm. Like all, all of the evidence points to the contrary, but they really hold on to that and there's mm -hmm. no talking out, them out of it. Is that linked to the whole 10 times one way thing you mentioned? The it might be. Uh, watch on YouTube, there is a TED talk by Anthony Robbins called Why We Do What We Do. 
even sometimes ridiculous behaviors, we get something out of it. And there are six human needs according to that system. Safety, variety, significance, love and connection, growth and contribution. A lot of times we kind of stick to certain points of view and we defend them, you know, fiercely because we get significance of it, perhaps, or we get safety out of it. And it, from the, like in a mammal brain or amygdala brain point of view, if we admit we are wrong, we are not safe anymore. We are not significant anymore. So it can kind of trigger that kind of very childlike fear response. And uh, so I think in combination, if you want to understand why people do that, I would suggest watching. Anyways, are you watching it already? Yeah. I like I like the impatience of. <laughs> do you want me to kind of imitate him here? Yeah. Everybody! <laughs> yeah, so, so I would recommend to watch Why We Do What We Do by Anthony Robbins and also Either you can get it as an audio book or read as a book, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. But he, he, he kind of explains the communication and behavior from the needs point of view. He has a very different system and he gives very, very practical advice how to express yourself um, in the way which you exp express your needs. Because sometimes we go like, you know, really, we do big detour to get our needs met. And sometimes, you know, kind of we, we choose the least efficient path, unfortunately. And it gives also some tips how to communicate when you're getting that, you know, somebody really stuck in certain behavioral patterns. Sometimes it takes one person to break a conflict. If, if one person is not engaged in the conflict, conflict can't happen. So I would suggest to check that out. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And... Uh, <laughs>